hope that you've had a great day today. Enjoyed the beautiful weather. And uh, spring is coming early this year. How many of you excited about that? Huh? Spring is coming. That's what the groundhog says. So, Philippians chapter number three. And uh, we will pick up reading in verse number one. I like that word rejoice, don't you? Rejoice, rejoice. Paul uses it many times here in this book of Philippians. He says in verse number three, uh, one of chapter three, finally, my brethren, rejoice in the Lord. To write the same things to you, to me, indeed, is not grievous, but for you, it is safe. Beware of dogs. Beware of evil workers. Beware of the concision. For we are the circumcision which worship God in the spirit and rejoice in Christ Jesus and have no confidence in the flesh. Though I might also have confidence in the flesh, if any other man thinketh that he hath whereof he might trust in the flesh, I more. And Paul goes on to say all the things that, uh, all the attributes that is, he possessed is circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, Pharisee. Concerning, uh, concerning zeal, persecuting the church, touching the righteousness, which is the law, blameless. But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Father, help us tonight as we look into your word, as we study from this passage of Scripture. Lord, help us to rejoice. Lord, in everything, give thanks. Lord, I pray that you would work in our hearts this evening. And uh, Lord, if there's anything that would cause us in our life that is discouraging to us or we're looking to uh, for the wrong reason lord to find find joy maybe we're looking to the wrong things and we're coming up empty lord i pray tonight that we would find joy in christ jesus in who he is and what he's done for us and his power and his strength and so lord i pray you encourage us tonight in jesus name amen Paul is demonstrating to those that might have been critical of the situation um, that he found himself in as we study uh, through this passage of Scripture. Paul is writing with Timothy. Paul is in jail. He's imprisoned. Paul is probably not, according to uh, how we would rate things, probably not in a position to be very happy or have a lot of joy. He finds himself in a, in a place where um, there's not a lot of good happening. And Paul spent about 25% of his missionary journeys, he spent in jails or prisons. It's a lot of time, isn't it? I mean, 20, 25% of his time he's spending in prisons, not because he's broken um, the law, not because he's done something necessarily wrong, but he finds himself here in this situation because he's preaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. 25% of his missionary journey he finds in jails, in prison, because he's preaching the gospel. Yet Paul continues to preach the gospel. Yet Paul writes this book to the Philippian church. He writes this church, uh, this, this epistle to a church, and he tells them to rejoice in the Lord. He, we see Paul, he introduces in this epistle, this, this second half of this epistle, his concerns, and he, he begins to bring out issues that had been plaguing the early churches and churches that he has loved, churches that he has invested in like this church, and that's false teachers. He, mainly the Judaizers, those that would come into people and, and really try to steal their joy. Here, many of, these, many of these Gentiles are saved. They, they are new creatures in Christ. They, they, they are freed from the bondage of sin. And the Judaizers come in and begin to put on the law. Like, well, you, you're, you're, you're saved now. Now you have to be circumcised. Or you're saved now. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, you now have to go back and start living the law. And put on these, these extra things to salvation. And these teachers have come in, and they do it in churches of, of really every generation. And especially here in the book of Philippians, they find that there's more to salvation. They're teaching there's more to salvation than your faith and trust in Jesus Christ. There's rules in, in the law and things that you have to follow if you're going to truly be saved. And those are things that are happening in churches today as well. Be careful. 
Paul is warning the church, and as we read through this portion of Scripture, I would say to our church as well, be careful. I've said this many a times, be careful when somebody adds to salvation. Be careful when someone tells you this, the prosperity gospel, they add to the, to the gospel. Be careful. Beware. Paul calls them, Paul calls them dogs. He, he calls them false teachers because they come in to try to steal away the joy that Jesus Christ gives you through salvation. These false teachers are going into these churches that Paul, he started, and they're teaching a works salvation. And what they're doing is undermining and discouraging these Gentile believers. In, in, in our text here tonight, I want us to see these important truths, and I want to just take, take a little bit of time tonight and look at what Paul shares with this Philippian church in relation to the gospel and in rejoicing in the truth. Every single person here tonight, no matter where you find yourself, physically, emotionally, wherever you find yourself, you have a reason to rejoice. And that reason is not the situation you find yourself in, but because of Jesus Christ. Paul is saying, look again with me if you would please. Finally, my brother, rejoice in what? In the Lord. Every single one of us have something to rejoice in. And so I just want to give you a few thoughts here this evening, and I know there's some activities after church this evening, and, uh, but I, I want us to, to get this from the Word of God. This is where rejoicing comes from. All right, number one, I want you to see this. Paul is going to give us, in this passage of Scripture, a cause for rejoicing. He's going to give us a cause. The, that word, finally, is concluding the previous section. We find here that very first word, finally, my brethren. It, it concludes the first section before we're going into the rest of this epistle, and he speaks about rejoicing. Finally, my brethren, rejoice. And this is a cause for rejoicing. Number one, I want you to see this, is a repeated thanks. Paul tells them to rejoice in the Lord. He's already used this rejoice, this word rejoice seven times previously in the scripture. And I won't take the time to go back through all of those times, but if you were to go back into the first two chapters of the book of Philippians, you would find that Paul seven times, he uses this word rejoice. Paul uses the form of this same word rejoice uh, uh, 12 times uh, in this word joy. So he uses rejoice and joy six more times in this book. So throughout this book, the first half of this book, he uses that word rejoice. Uh, he, in the second half of this book, he uses this word joy. Many times through this epistle, he's consistently using this word rejoice or joy. And again, it's important for us to see and remember where Paul finds himself in. Paul's not finding himself in the end of his ministry where he's taking at ease and every, all of his hard work is paying off and, and all, of his, all of the investments that he made. And, and no, people have left Paul. People have hurt Paul. False teachers have come in and tried to destroy the work that Paul's doing. And now just Paul finds himself in a prison cell knowing this is probably going to be the end. There's not much left. Paul is going to find himself, uh, his life is going to be taken from him for simply preaching the gospel. Yet as he teaches and as he's uh, presenting this epistle to his, uh, to his uh, church, here he's saying this on 12 different times, joy or rejoice. But he says this again. I want, to, I want to remind you where he finds this rejoicing in here in this half of this uh, epistle. It's in the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul had joy. He was a man of rejoicing. And he desired those that he loved and those that he ministered to that they would have joy in their lives as well. Paul was not interested in those that he loved having a defeated spirit. Listen, we understand that last several weeks I've preached on end times and how do we as Christians behave when it seems like the world is spiraling out of control. And this would be one that I would add to that a Christian in end times ought to be living a life of joy, living a life where they're rejoicing. You say, well, you don't understand what's happening. And I know this week, uh, surgeries are filling up and, and uh, uh, people have doctor's appointments and, and there's hurt and there's heartache. And, and we understand all those things and none of those things that we're, we're, we're belittling or saying they're not significant in our life. But in the midst of all of those things, Christian, we have something to rejoice in. And that's rejoicing in the fact that Jesus Christ, he loved us, he died for our sins, he's forgiven us of our sins, and we 
we have everlasting life. There's something for every single believer to rejoice in, and that's rejoicing in Jesus Christ. A quote by Charles Haddon Spurgeon. How many of you know you've read anything about Spurgeon over the years? When the heart is full of joy, it always allows its joy to escape. It is like the fountain in the marketplace. Whenever it is full, it runs away into streams. And so soon as it ceases to overflow, you may be quite sure that it has ceased to be full. I like this part of this quote. He says, the only full heart is the overflowing heart. The only full heart is the overflowing heart. A believer ought to be overflowing in his joy. This time when Paul says rejoice, he adds, before he used that word rejoice many times, this time in chapter number three, he adds that word, those three words, in the Lord. And Paul, Paul connects something here. He, he connects rejoicing to a relationship. And don't miss this tonight, please. He connects this, this word rejoicing to a relationship. He's addressing the believers, right? In verse number three, he says, finally, my brethren. He's addressing the believers. He addresses them to have joy, and he addresses this. He connects this word joy to a relationship. The reason we should rejoice is because of our relationship with Jesus Christ, is what Paul's saying. Every one of us have something to rejoice in because of our relationship with Jesus Christ. And so we find this, a cause of rejoicing we find for Paul is just repeated things. It's an attitude of rejoicing. Wherever you find yourself in, Christian, wherever you find yourself this week, just remember that your joy is found in your relationship with Jesus Christ. Why is it so important for us as believers to be in God's word? Why is it so important for us to fellowship with Christ, to be daily in devotion and daily in his word and in prayer? Why is it so important? Because anytime, anytime we let that time lapse between time with the Lord in his word and in prayer, we have so many pressures that the world gives us. How many of you would agree, and you don't have to raise your hand to this, but how many would you agree this, that the world, it, it, it's not, the world is not a respecter of persons. It just throws at you more than you can handle at times. It just continues to, to bombard you. The things of this world and the discouragements of this world. Because of sin, there's so many issues and so many problems, and, and we can be bombarded with those things. But the believer ought to have repeated thanks. Continue in joy. That joy comes through a relationship with Jesus Christ. Hear, hear me tonight, believer. We cannot survive just on what we get on Sundays. We can't. You, you, you will starve as a Christian if you're only fed when you come to this place. You'll starve. You've got to have a relationship with Christ. What type of marriage would you have if you only talked once a week? I know some of you are thinking, that's all we talk. I don't know. I mean, can it get better than that? Yes. One of the greatest things you can do is fellowship and have a, have a relationship with your spouse. I uh, taught at a conference this past week, and, and um, Michelle found out what time of year it was, and she said, well, good, I'm going with you, because it was west, and it was warm and sunny, we looked up. Today, everyone was excited about how beautiful it was here, and, and uh, I was excited as well because I'm here, but boy, where we were, it was 70 and sunny all week long. It was beautiful. And um, I'll tell you, one of the things I enjoyed, it was just me and her, no kids, no dogs. I should have put no dogs first, I guess, right? No dogs, no kids. Just time with her just taking some walks we took a walk the other day and between while well, we had some free time I took took a walk with her and, and I said to her this we need to do this more often don't we and she says I've been telling you that <laughs> just eating uh, a meal with her without rushing and I said boy isn't this nice just to eat and talk and she said it sure is Sometimes we get so busy. Sometimes we get so hectic in our life. And sometimes that busyness in that, that uh, uh, busyness in our life can bring a critical spirit, can bring us to discouragement. And we're busy doing good things, but we're not busy uh, 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 
in our relationship, helping our relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ grow. Once you're saved, Jesus wants that relationship that he now has with you to be cultivated and to grow. Yet if we're not careful, Christian, we can let the pressures and the things of this world keep us from growing in Christ. We'll lose our joy. And I want to, I want to be sure this evening that I say this, as Paul said often in this epistle, just repeated thanks, continuing to be thankful. I want you tonight, I want you to, the person next to you, whether you're married to them or not, it could be a sibling, it could be someone you don't even like, maybe next to you. Tell them something you're thankful for. Go ahead, right now, tell them something you're thankful for. You're not talking very loud. Something that you're thankful for. Then I want you to tell them something about them that you're thankful for. Good. Something about them. Now we even got more quiet in here. You're thankful for. How many of you are thankful for something this evening? How many of you would say this? You don't express it enough at times. I know I don't. You know, it's, that, it's like that old, that old fella that had that, uh, been married for years and, and his wife says, how come you don't tell me you love me anymore? He said, I told you the day I married you and I figured that was enough. If I ever change my mind, I'll tell you. Well, that's not enough. I, I, we want to hear it all the time. We want to hear it every day. One of the things I believe that we ought to have is a repeated things. Tell people around you the things that you thank God for and don't forget to tell the Lord the things you're thankful for. I want you to write this down too. There's a cause for rejoicing that Paul has. It's repeated thanks, continuing to be thankful. Also, it's a love for the, uh, for the truth. Paul said it was safe for him to write these things to the Philippians. He was, he was saying that their safety depended on hearing and acting on what he was telling them. He says, what I'm going to tell you, it's safe. You need to hear it. Remember, he's telling them there's some things that you're hearing that aren't safe. False teachers, be careful of them. Not everything you hear is something safe for you to hear. I've said this to you many times. Not every single time somebody stands up that you find on, a, on, on YouTube or you find on the internet or you find even on, on television, everything you hear isn't always truth. And you've got to be discerning about that. And if you hear things that takes out your joy and takes away your joy and puts the pressure on you and puts everything on you and causes you to be critical, listen to me, that's not something that we ought to give an ear to. It. Paul says, what I'm going to tell you, it's safe, it's truth. Trust me, as you trusted me in the beginning when you heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, trust me in what I'm about to say. That word trust there, it means this, the opposite of fail. Paul was saying that, that unlike the teaching of these false prophets that he mentioned, which, which you can't, you can't uh, withstand, you can't hear, he says, the things I'm teaching you, you check it against Scripture. You know what you're going to find? It's true. Every single thing you hear from the Word of God, how do you know if it's truth? Check it against Scripture. And that's how you know it's true. If you can find it in Scripture, believe it. Paul says, what I'm about ready to tell you, you check it. It's true. It's safe. You, you mark this down. This, you can rely on this doctrine. And truth is safeguarded. We, we need to have joy. We can have joy because we have truth, Christian. We have joy because we have the Word of God. We have truth. Could you imagine being uh, uh, someone that doesn't have the Word of God to guide you? Could you imagine trying to figure out what truth is in this world that is full of deceit? It isn't amazing? You can turn on two different news channels and be hearing about the same event, but two totally different viewpoints. And you walk away, you say, what is truth? You can hear a conversation, two totally different viewpoints. You walk away and you say, what is truth? I tell you, one of the hardest things I do, and you have a husband and wife, they come in your office and they describe the same exact situation, but they blame the other for it. And you say, what is truth? 
Our young people are growing up in a world that, that truth is whatever you want it to be, however you want to live, whoever you want to be, and, and whoever you want to love. It doesn't matter. Just be who you want to be. But I want to say to you, it's difficult to have joy in that because it's not truthful. It always leads back to shame. It always leads back to guilt. It always leads back to uh, a wrong decision. But we as Christians, we can rejoice because we have the truth. That truth keeps us free from deception and lies. John 8, 31 and 32, the Bible says this, Then said Jesus to those Jews which believed on him, If ye continue in my word, then ye are my disciples indeed, and ye shall know the truth. And what does he say? The truth shall make you free. Listen, so many people are going through life, and they want freedom, and they want victory, and they're trying to find it outside of Jesus Christ. Oh, Christian, listen, we are set free. That ought to give us joy when we need some answers, when we need to know what to do when we're unsure of what tomorrow is going to hold we can go into the word of God and we know if the word of God says it then it's true and that ought to give the believer joy you know there were so many people that met in places places of worship we'll call them all around this world and they opened up something other than the word of God today and they're not going to walk out with any more truth than when they walked in they're going to be hopeless Yet we come in week after week, service after service, we open the word of God, and any answer we need to find, we know that we can find it in the word of God. That ought to give us, Christian, time to rejoice. The truth keeps us free from deception and lies. Number two, the truth lines up with the Holy Scripture's guidance. John 16, 13 says this, How be it when we, the Spirit of truth, is come, he will guide you into all truth. For he shall not speak of himself, but whosoever he shall hear, that shall, that shall he speak, and he will show you things to come. Listen to me, we have the Word of God. We don't, we, it keeps us from lies and deceptions. We also have the Holy Spirit of God. That ought to cause us to rejoice. Listen, I know sometimes we don't like when the Spirit of God convicts us, but listen, we ought to rejoice when the Spirit of God convicts us. I had someone text me this afternoon, and they said, Pastor, I just want you to know I, I'm a manager at a, at a company, and I just want you to know I really enjoyed that message today. Because there were some things about me that I needed to hear about leadership. What he was saying was this, I was convicted at someone else before I even left this after the second service someone came up to me and said boy that really convicted me on parenting this this morning and and I didn't even think I really spoke on parenting I was just talking about leadership and they said this we I I, I have a different view on on raising my children and, and I appreciate that my home has not always been a place of peace and I I look to my leadership because of that Boy, when, I, when people respond and, 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 and say how the Spirit of God convicted them and helped them, that's something to rejoice in. Listen, I, I too, I love, like tonight's message, we're talking about rejoicing and talking about joy and a relationship with Christ and growing that relationship with Christ. And what a wonderful thing that is, but, but the Holy Spirit of God convicting us and guiding us and leading us and sometimes pointing things out in our life, we ought to rejoice that we have the Spirit of God that helps us figure things out. Helps us when we line up something we hear. He begins to uh, move in our heart and, and, and show us what truth is. The Spirit of God always lines up with the Word of God. Always. Anytime the Spirit of God isn't lining up with the Word of God, something's wrong. Something's always wrong because the Spirit of God always lines up with the word of God the truth lines up with the spirit's guidance and thirdly the truth is the foundation of our sanctification it's the word of God John 17 17 the Bible says sanctify sanctify them through thy truth thy word is truth truth keeps us from something truth lines up with something and truth is our foundation 
And so we see here in this passage of Scripture that Paul is telling the church here at Philippi, and we here at Monclova Road can benefit from this epistle this evening, and we see the cause of rejoicing. Number two, I see this. There's a concern for the church. Paul is concerned for the church. In verse number two, he says this, Beware of dogs. Beware of evil. Now, something interesting. Paul calls out false teachers. And, and, and this wouldn't be politically correct in today's world. I mean, people get mad when you call something out or say something is the way it needs to be said. We've gotten to the, to the, to the place, if we're not careful as Christians, we're even, we're even politically correct when it comes to the Word of God. And, and Paul, though, has a concern, and Paul's concern for that church is he doesn't want that church to be led astray. That word beware means to see with the mind's eye or to discern mentally. He says, I, I command them to, to be constantly watching for these false teachers. Be careful. Now, what happens in these days, it would be a false teacher that would come into the, to the church the, the, where they're meeting and, and uh, begin to teach some things, begin to share some things, begin to put their uh, 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 slant on some things. And again, in this, this specific portion of Scripture, it's, it's the Judaizers telling those that are Gentiles, that are believers now, specifically one of the things that Paul dealt much with is that, hey, they have to be circumcised now. And Paul is telling him, where are you getting that from? It's dangerous. I believe we're even more dangerous today. Because it's not necessarily in the Sunday school class or maybe in the pulpit or a guest preacher that comes in, although all of those things, I believe, as the warning is, beware. But now the church goes home and the church can get the internet and television and radio and I mean you can get it all the time everywhere some of the things that I hear somebody will ask me what is your opinion on that and I'll say where in the world did you hear that from oh I've been listening to so and so now there's a great effort and churches are becoming um, uh, internet churches there's great effort to become that. Uh, we don't need to meet anymore. Just sit down and watch at your convenience. And, and I would say this church, that goes against Scripture. The Bible says, forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is. How do you fellowship? How do you encourage? That's important, and we can show you all through Scripture how important that is. There's a, there's a reason why the church came together in that New Testament church as we study through the book of Acts, and they came together daily, and they met in the house daily because they needed the encouragement. They needed the fellowship. You needed the sharpening of the believer. You needed the teaching. And Paul has a concern here. When it came to defending the truth, Paul, he didn't mince words. One of the things I like about Paul, he, he plainly exposed false doctrine and he thoroughly warned Christians to avoid it. Paul didn't mince words. Paul calls them dogs. He calls them false teachers. There, there's other scripture, and I won't take the time to go to it tonight. Other times, he points them out by name. Be careful of this person. They're just there to, to harm you. They're just there for their own preeminence. They're just there because they're haughty. They're just there and they're taking you away and they're, they're pulling you apart. Listen to me, when anything, when, when the concern here, when anyone comes in and teaches you something and it causes division and it causes discouragement, then Paul warns them, be careful what you hear because when the word of God is preached, the spirit of God leads and even it's, it's something that we don't want to hear but we know we want need to hear and the spirit of God convicts us then what it ought to do is it ought to bring joy into our life a growing Christian should be a joyful Christian and so he says there's a great concern here Vance um, Havner said this the early Christians condemned false doctrine in a way that sounds almost unchristian today (laughs) 
That's how much Paul and the early Christians warned. They, they called him names. It was almost unchristlike. But they loved the church so much they wanted to protect the church from un, unclean wolves. Dogs were like wolves in Bible times. They were scavengers that roamed in packs and, and uh, they ate garbage, uneatable body, uh, parts of animals and dead corpse and they even ate their own vomit. And this is what Paul said, be careful, these people are dogs. He calls them what we just read, what a dog did, what a dog was. This dog, it was, when he uses this word dog, he's describing the character of the type of person who was a false teacher. He, he's not looking at them and describing them physically what he's saying. This is this person's character. They would just want to devour. They just want to tear you apart. They just want to disrupt and break up the church. In Acts 20, 29, the Bible says, For I know this, that after many departing shall fall grievous wolves entering among you, not sparing the flock. Paul warned, and in, in, in our last days, we need to be careful of this, coming in and beginning to, to uh, 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 hurt the flock and, 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 and bring gr uh, grievous things to the church and, and not sparing the flock. That means this, they come in with the intent to harm. They want you to leave discouraged. Listen, Satan doesn't want a church that's full of joy to exist. He doesn't want you to have the relationship with Paul, that, uh, with Christ that Paul encourages us to have. He doesn't want you to have a, a good, solid Bible teaching that without false teachers around because he doesn't want a church to leave when it comes together and then leaves and, and goes out and is, uh, is a light to a, a dark world, salt to a, a, a world that needs flay, say, uh, uh, salt. He doesn't, he, doesn't, he doesn't want the Christian to leave here with joy. He doesn't want the home that, that represents a Christian home to to be different than the world's home. He doesn't want your marriage to be uh, uh, pure and holy. He doesn't want your relationship to be right. He wants you to, to leave discouraged and not, not uh, lifting up the name of Christ, but living just like a dark world lives. That's what Satan's after. And that's what unclean wolves and dogs do. In 2 Peter 2, in verse number 1, but there were false prophets also among the people even as there shall be false teachers among you who privately shall bring in uh, damnable heresies, even denying the Lord that uh, brought them and bring up themselves swift destruction. He says in verse number 19, while they uh, promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of the corruption. For of whom a man is overcome of the same as he brought into bondage. He says in verse number 22, in 2 Peter 2, Peter says, But it has happened unto them according to the truth, uh, the truth proverb, the dog is turned to his own vomit again, and so that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Listen, Peter even begins uh, to, to warn the church, as in his epistle, he's warning the church, be careful of this. What it does is it steals you of your joy. Paul may have used that word, that term dogs, in reference to false teachers who plagued these churches in his ministry. These were the Judaizers, those that began to put the people back into bondage. These unclean wolves, beware. He uses this word evil, evil workers. Be careful of this church because there are some false teachers that think they're doing good. There, there are some that are dogs. They're going in just to simply tear apart the church. There, there's, a, there's a movement going around, and there's a, there's a, a man that is out west, and, and he teaches a lot of false things. And, and um, it's because of the Internet, so many people around the country hear of these things, and they go into churches, and the churches uh, talk to different pastors, and they'll ask, have you dealt with such and such yet? And I'll say, no, I haven't, had that, haven't dealt with that yet. But they'll say that these people come into these churches on purpose to divide, to tear it up, on purpose, to sow discord. Then there's some that they're not doing it necessarily to do that. They're, they think they're right. There, there, there's, there's this, dealt with this a few times in the last couple of years. There's 
this teaching that there's nothing profitable that we as Christians can get from the Old Testament, and really there's nothing profitable from about Romans on is all that we as Christians should be studying. And this is something that I've dealt with several, several people here at this church. They listen, and someone began to share this with someone else, and a couple different people brought this to my attention. I said, where do we go then? What, what do we do with all scriptures given by inspiration of God and is profitable? Jesus taught a, a different gospel. No, Jesus didn't teach a different gospel than Paul. And Paul is not teaching a different gospel than, than, than what Peter taught. I mean, to say that the Old Testament is not profitable to the New Testament believer is just insane. But there's preachers that are teaching that. And I don't believe their motive is to teach it to be divisive. I think they really believe what they're saying. But when anyone tells you, again, let the Holy Spirit of God lead you. And if anybody tells you something contrary to the Word of God, if I got up and said, there's only a few chapters, there's only a few books in this Bible that are profitable to us in 2020, then, then someone ought to stand up and say, then what do you do with all scriptures given by inspiration of God is profitable? Well, that, that verse right there discredits that statement. We need to make sure that when someone says something that we don't just, just simply believe it because we heard it or someone we like. Well, I, they've been saved a long time and they like that, so I, I'll listen to what they have to say. No, if what you're hearing goes against the word of God, then it's not truth. Paul calls it evil. Matter of fact, if it goes contrary to the word of God, it is evil. Paul said this to the Corinthian church in 2 Corinthians 11, for such are false apostles, deceitful workers, transforming themselves in the apostles of Christ. Boy, Paul just goes right at it. He says these are, are false apostles. These are deceitful workers. They're transforming themselves into apostles of Christ and, and no marvel for Satan himself is transformed into an angel of light. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also, he calls these false teachers Satan's ministers. Hear me, you say, well, I, I, that is just, that's difficult to say. If anybody takes this word and begins to preach a different gospel, they are not ministers of Jesus Christ. They're ministers of Satan, Paul says. If anybody's going to take this and deceive you and cause division, they're not ministers of Jesus Christ. Even if they say they are, they're false teachers. They're ministers of Satan. Therefore, it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness righteousness whose end shall be according to their works he talks about evil worshipers and he talks about false or evil workers and false worshipers that word concision was used of the jews and it was used in particular the judaizers who were trying to draw christians from their liberty in christ to a life of bondage again under the rituals and practices of the law now, it's profitable to read the Old Testament. It's profitable to learn from the Old Testament. But be careful when people start to pick and choose in the Old Testament and say that you ought to do this and do that. We don't make sacrifices any longer. Be careful when somebody goes in the Old Testament. Somebody sat with me one time not long ago and said, we need to be doing this, this, and this. And I said, where do you find that in Scripture? Old Testament. I said, that's wonderful. Let's look at these next three verses. You're not doing those three things. So what are you picking and choosing? Picking and choosing what you fit. Picking and choosing what you want done. Be careful of false worshipers that try to bring us into bondage and start to rituals and practices of the law. Be careful of that, Paul says. He says this in Galatians 5, 1 and 3, Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the yoke of bondage. Behold, I, Paul, say unto you that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you nothing. What was he saying? It doesn't matter if you're circumcised any longer. You don't have to be, as a Gentile, as a, 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 a believer in Christ, you don't have to go back and, and do all the rituals and do all the things that are under the law. You are free from that. Christ shall profit profit you nothing for I testify again to every man that is circumcised that he is a debtor to the to do the whole law Paul is saying there to the church here in Galatians he says don't listen to those that tell you that be careful of that 
anyone that tries to add to Scripture, they are false worshipers. You don't have to be, worship the way, in the, uh, the way of the law any longer. You are free from those things. And I'm done with this. I know there's some th- parties tonight. Number three is a confidence in Christ. Paul says we can have joy because of the confidence in Christ. Paul says, for we are the circumcision, referring to true believers. We are not saved by a ritual that is meaningless, but by genuine faith in Jesus Christ. Listen, I'm so glad that we're not saved by a ritual, aren't you? I'm so, I'm so glad that we're not saved because some man thought of something. I'm so glad that we're not saved because some man found something in a cave somewhere and brought it out and, 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 and said that an angel gave it to him. And, and I'm so glad that what we believe isn't constantly changing. I'm so glad that a relationship, what we're speaking of, is not religion. I'm so glad that there's not a, not a, not a, a pope that can just continually change whatever he wants to change and what we believe. We're not saved because of what man thinks and because of what man said. Our confidence in his, is in Jesus Christ in what he did upon the cross. He says this, the truly circumcised ones were the Christians who had been circumcised of the heart of unbelief. In Colossians chapter number two, Bear with me here, I'm winding down. In whom also ye are circumcised with the circumcision made without hands and putting off the body of the sin of the flesh by the circumcision of Christ, buried with him in baptism, wherein also ye are risen with him through the faith of the operation of God, who hath raised him from the dead, and you being dead in your sins and the uncircumcision of your flesh, hath he quickened together with him, having forgiven all trespass, blotting out the handwriting of ordinance that was against us, which was contrary contrary to us and took it out of the way nailing it to the cross what wonderful verses those are what simply says is Christ did all the work you sinned he paid your sin debt it's nailed to the cross and if you put your faith and trust in him that's what matters we have something to have joy in because of the confidence that we have in Jesus Christ he says this is a true faith it's it's from the heart true worship from the church is not found in a geographical location it is worshiping God from the heart John 4, 23 and 24 says, Jesus tells a woman that true worship will be the, in the spirit as well as truth. And, uh, uh, but that hour cometh and now is where the true worshiper shall worship the Father in spirit and in truth. For the Father seeketh such to worship him. God is a spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Truth. True faith is from the heart. And true faith is from the heart toward Christ. True worship is from the heart and is focused not on our actions, but on Jesus Christ. That's where we find joy. That's why we can rejoice. Because it's a trusting faith. It's a true faith. And it's a trusting faith. The Christian faith is reliant upon God's power and the Holy Spirit. Not the efforts of flesh to make oneself look spiritual. Please hear this. We are not to trust in the arm of flesh. Too often religion wants to fix the outside while the inside is a mess. We want to concentrate on the things that we see instead of on the heart. There's some things in my home that we we do and we have and just, just because of the way that we do things. They're called preferences in our home. And if my kids leave my home and they do it differently than those preferences in our home, you know what? It's not going to break any fellowship with me and my children. Because I want their heart to be right. Now they leave our home and they don't want a relationship with Christ and they don't want to follow his word and they want to be disobedient to his word. That's going to break fellowship with us. It's going to be difficult. Am I going to still love them? Of course I'm going to still love them. But they're going to be departing from the truth. There's a difference between the two. And that's what Paul is warning here. There's a difference between 
truth and then what man comes along and tries to add to truth. In John 6, 63, it's the spirit that quickeneth. The flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, they are our spirit and they are life. Psalm 28, 7 and 8, the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusteth in what? In him. And I am helped. Therefore my heart greatly rejoiceth and with my song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength and he is the saving strength of his anointed. It's the Lord. We put our strength, we put our trust in what never changes. The Bible says that God is the same yesterday, today, and forever and we ought to praise God for that. We can rejoice in that, that he never changes. Rejoice in the fact that his word never changes. I know as culture changes and there's some things, I'll be honest with you, there's some things I'd like if the Bible would change on it, make life lot easier but one thing that we can rejoice in is this it's never gonna change you can't put joy in something that's constantly changing that you you you, you'll never know what what what's right and what's wrong rejoice in the fact that this book never changes rejoice in the fact that this is your strength rejoice in the fact that he is our saving strength of his anointed what the false teachers were saying was contrary to the power and the freedom that we have in christ jesus It was leading people into the bondage of the flesh. When the power of God frees us from this very bondage. Hear this, I close with this. Jesus did not die for us that we might continue to live in the means of the flesh. But so that we can live in the Spirit's power. You can't live this victorious Christian life in your own strength, in your own power, doing religious things. In Christian, you don't have to. And that's why many times many Christians don't possess the joy they should have because they're trying to live this Christian life in their own strength, their way. Jesus didn't die so that you could live it in your own strength. You now possess the Spirit of God and He and He alone has that power to help you live the victorious Christian life. And so his spirit and his word, to rejoice in the truth, we must be willing to confront false teachers, their teaching, and we must worship Christ in spirit and in truth. How many of you want to rejoice tonight? Would you say amen? Amen. Then we must do it in spirit and in truth, and we must worship Christ. Don't listen to false teachers. Let the Holy Spirit of God work. Father, help us tonight as we... Lord, we.